All right, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. A familiar parable. Parable of the talents or the minas. Um, this is a parable concerning the kingdom of God. Everybody say the kingdom of God. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was nearing Jerusalem because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He's coming back, in case you wanna know. And so he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minus, and said to them, do business, the King James Version says, occupy, I like the word occupy, carry on, keep on going, keep pressing, keep fighting, occupy until I come. I want to use that familiar parable to talk to you um, about a few things that I feel like the church as a whole needs to hear. It says, occupy until I come. But what are we to occupy? Well, it tells us it's the kingdom of God. You might say, well, how do we occupy the kingdom of God until he comes? And it also teaches us that that we are not owners, but we are stewards. We're to steward the kingdom until he comes. You might remember hearing that phrase, Occupy Wall Street, back in 2011. It's a phrase that was coined because of the protest that began on Saturday, December 18th, 2010. A revolutionary wave of public demonstrations began that rocked the Muslim world. It all started when a 26-year-old Tunisian street vendor named Muhammad Wazizi set himself on fire. He was protesting the repeated humiliation and harassment that had been inflicted upon him by local authorities. Within hours, mass protests engulfed the streets of that city. Within one month, the president of that country had fled, and the wave of unrest swept across national boundaries all over the world. Corrupt governments, one after another, after another, were dismantled and overthrown. This moment in history changed the hopes and the dreams of millions of people. A simple street vendor shook the world. And it leads us all to know what can happen when one man chooses to set himself on fire. John Wesley was once asked, why do so many people come to hear you preach? And he said, I just set myself on fire and they come to watch me burn. Spurgeon said, put some fire in the sermon or put the sermon in the fire. I think it applies to what I do, but I think it also applies to what you do. Doesn't do me any good if I put fire in the sermon if you don't put fire into listening to the sermon. Right, what did those two that walked with Jesus onto the road to Emmaus, what did they say? They said that our hearts burned within us as we heard him speak. It's not just I'm burning, it's your burning as well. If you sing a song, Put some fire in the song or put the song in the fire. When you come into God's house and you worship and you offer him that sacrifice of praise, put some fire in your worship. Put some fire in your service to him. Or what good is it? You see, the thing that we see in this story where that Occupy Wall Streets was coined is it takes a special kind of sacrifice to start a revolution. Revolutions are not created equal and not all revolutions are noble. Stakes are different in different places and in different times. We are potentially in a different time. Revolution without sacrifice always ends in rebellion. Revolution is from the Latin word revoltus, which means to turn or to roll back. Rebellion is from the Latin word rebellionist, which means to wage war. So this teaches us that revolution is selfless, 
rebellion is selfish. Revolution unites, rebellion divides. Revolution returns us to the great principles of the past. Rebellion sacrifices the great principles of the past for cheap comforts in the present. Revolution costs me deeply. Rebellion always cost others deeply. So if you look at world history or you look at church history, revolutions have always been necessary. And so I wanna give you three insights into a divine revolution. Number one, Christianity is a revolutionary kingdom. That's what we read about in our text, the kingdom of God. So this is not a republic. This is not a democracy. It is not a dictatorship. It is a kingdom. We are part of the kingdom of God. And kingdoms are run by the rule of a king. Not the mood of the masses, not the temperature of the times, but the rule of the king. The apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Jesus is king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. He's king and this is his kingdom. And he invites us, he extends an invitation to you and I to enter his kingdom. However, we must do it on his terms or we don't do it at all. If you wanna enter a relationship with the king, I hesitate to tell you, it is his kingdom and it is his, it is his terms, otherwise there is no deal. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, not your spirit, your body, your physical world, your physical life, your everyday life, what you do, your actions, everything about you, not just your spirit. If you have Jesus in your heart, you let him out. Jesus is never content being held hostage in your heart. He wants to impact every iota of your life. He said, present your body. Your physical life, your life, that's what you're here today doing. You're giving your body, your time, your physical world. And he says that that is a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to kill yourself. He's asking you to be a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the altar brings, the priest would bring sacrifices to the altar the fire on the altar would burn that sacrifice. The aroma of the sacrifice would go up to the throne of God and God would enjoy the aroma of the sacrifice. So a living sacrifice in the same way never stops burning for him. A living sacrifice, it goes on to say, is our reasonable service. So setting yourself on fire, allowing yourself to be a living sacrifice to burn for him and to be zealous for his kingdom is your reasonable service. Paul told Timothy that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that he only has immortality. He dwells in the light which no man can approach unto and no one has seen him or can see him. To him be honor and power everlasting. He is a king. He is an immortal king. He existed before anything you see existed. He's not a coach, he's a king. He's not a mentor, he's a king. He's not an advisor or a counselor, he is a king. He's not a professor, he is a king. And before anything you see existed, he existed as king over it all. And what you and I have to remember is we've been invited into his kingdom. It is our privilege and it is our honor. It's not his privilege and his honor that we're here. It's our honor and it's our privilege that we would be invited into his kingdom. Amen. A divine revolution begins with understanding Christianity has always been and always will be a revolutionary kingdom. 
Number two, how this plays itself out is we are stewards or what's known as the priesthood principle. When you go to God's original mandate for his people, he made an entire nation, the nation of Israel, a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19 and verse six, you shall, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you will speak unto all concerning the children of Israel, so, so that the entire nation is designed to function as a priest, as priest. What is a priest? The person who offers sacrifices to a holy God. The person who offers sacrifices to the king. It goes on to say that I want you to also be a holy nation. So all these sacrifices that you're bringing, all these sacrifices that you're making, that I'm asking you for, is what separates you as my people and even though to the world you'll be odd and unusual and peculiar, you'll be a rare treasure to me. So we are a kingdom of priests. This means that this is not just a few people that come together and we work hard and people are in a crowd and they applaud us. We're all participating, every single one of us, in this thing called a kingdom of priests. When you come to church, it is not a place you attend. If you see it as a place you attend, attenders usually become pretenders. This is a gathering of the kingdom. So when we make it the type of thing where if the music is right and they sing the songs that I like and the temperature is just right and the sermon is just right and our favorite speaker is speaking and everything is just so and we get the seat that we want and no one does anything, that, any, that, 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 then we tip God on our way out. It's not, that's not what we're a part of. That's how the world acts. That's how the world thinks. We are a kingdom of priests. Not a few people doing the heavy lifting. It's a kingdom of priests. First Peter says, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar. Peculiar means a rare treasure. What makes us a treasure, it goes on to say, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In times past, you were not a people, but now you are a people. In times past, you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. And because of that, you and I have the priesthood principle, which is what? Stewardship, service, and sacrifice. And the bottom line of that is knowing you owe God something. He owes you nothing. He's owner. He's the owner. He's king. So as the owner, what's the root word of owner is owe. So paint it however you want. We owe him our lives. We owe God our blessings. We owe God our possessions. We owe God our very breath. We owe God our eternity. We owe God everything. Our culture does not understand priesthood. That's why we need a divine revolution. It's always had to occur, and it will always need to occur, where we'll be reminded that we need a divine revolution. Why? Because what got us here is what will get us there, and occupy until he comes. What got us here, what occupied up until this point, is how we occupy until he comes. So what does our culture understand? the big guy at the top. They understand prestige and position. They understand leadership. They understand celebrity. But they don't understand priesthood. Our culture cringes at words like submit and serve. We cringe at words like sacrifice and service and stewardship. I own my life. This is my life. Every now and then, you'll meet someone who realizes what I'm talking about. And these are people who sacrifice those things that are so dear to them to advance the cause of Christ, our King, and people don't understand it. 
It confounds them. But what got us here will get us there. So this is not a message that I'm bringing to the world out there. I'm bringing it to those of you who are in here. So our problem begins when we let the culture out there reflect in here. Big eyes and little U's. Let me show you how I see that a lot happen in church. Um, sometimes I try to get out in the lobby as much as I can. And one of the things that I have a privilege of doing is shaking hands and meeting people and praying with people. I always enjoy it. And if you've done this before, I'm not coming at you. I've been there. I've done the same things before. It's not a big deal. But I've learned over the years that a lot of times what happens is people will say things like, hey, I, I, how can I get an appointment with you? How can I get a coffee with you? How can I? And I understand. I'm not, I don't have a problem with it. Hey, will you do this or will you do that? And they'll even say things like this. Um, I come from a church where I need to know my pastor. And I understand. It's, it's the idea that I'm the most important that bothers me. It's the idea that, that if I don't do it, in some way you feel less important. Like I'm the one that has to establish your importance. And my thing is we're a kingdom of priests. We're all important. You don't need me to make you feel important. What I'm saying is, is it sounds spiritual, but it's a worldly concept. I'm not saying I should shirk the work and not be available. And not, I'm not saying that. I love to do those things. I really do. And I do as much as I can. But what I'm saying is that the idea that if I'm not running myself into the ground to meet every immediate need and get every cat out of a tree, that I'm not a pastor to you. Uh, things like that. Well, I just want to know my pastor. So if I eat dinner with you, you know me. Some of y'all live with people 20 years and you don't know them. So you don't know somebody. You don't know me because I've shaken hands with celebrities and, and professional athletes. I don't know them. Y'all feeling me? So we can't make it about a person is what I'm implying. You don't make it about me. We make it about him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There can't be any big eyes or little U's. Across the board, what this simply means is I'm not so arrogant to say that you're not important enough for my time. But I am bold enough to say that Evan's important enough for your time. And other pastors and leaders are important enough for your time. And other small group leaders are important enough for your time. And that I'm not the only important one. And the way we built this church and the way God builds his kingdom is to make it about more than one man. He built a kingdom of priests. We steward it together, we sacrifice together, and we serve one another together. We bear one, another bur one another's burdens. Not the preacher bears everyone's burdens. We bear one another's burdens. I'm not correcting you. I'm just showing you how it plays out in religious ways that sound holy and, 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 and righteous, but they're really secular in nature. 
Our leadership, our talents, our blessings are to be in service to the king. We are priests unto God. We are first and foremost priests unto him. This is the priesthood principle. And it began when God created the nation of Israel and it has never been discarded. We submit to the one who reigns over us. Our main job is not to reign over others, but to submit to the one who reigns over us. This principle is how we occupy until he comes. It's not our kingdom. You're not my people. This is not my church. This is not my ministry. This is God's church. You're God's sons and daughters. This is his ministry. It belongs to him. And I'm not touching it. Matthew 18 says, at the same time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Lord, who's the greatest? And he gave him the priesthood principle once again, the one who serves. What's he saying? To you and I, I'm not king, you're not king. There's only one king and his name is Jesus. Amen. When I die, my job, if it's done well, I will be forgotten. But he will be remembered. My main job is to not create a legacy after myself. My main job is to create a place where God is big and man is small. Where Jesus is on the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe fills the temple. In other words, everywhere you look, you see him. You see his glory. You see his power. You see his mercy. You see his grace. You see his goodness. You see his kindness. Not my or your brother or sister's inadequacies. And my job is your job. Make him big. Number three, revolution means to turn or roll back. So what do we turn or roll back to? So about 2,000 years ago, we encounter our first divine revolution in spring of 30 AD. Simple group of people that loved their king and served in his kingdom. You find about 120 of them that were in an upper room. Those are our ancestors. And they were known by worshiping passionately, praying ferociously. Tongues like fire set on each of them. What's this an example of? They were a living sacrifice. That upper room was an altar. And God came down and he licked up the sacrifice of their worship and their praise and they never stopped burning we're here today because of they set themselves on fire we could go throughout history and find other examples I could find many but let's just go back 120 years or so and look at 60 people in the spring of 1906 that we're meeting in a decrepit building at 312 Azusa Street in Los Angeles. They had day and night prayer meetings that ran for over three years. Frank Bartleman, who was a participant in what became one of the greatest revivals of the 20th century, said concerning the leader, Brother Seymour, he could usually be seen behind two empty milk boxes, one on top of the other. He usually kept his head inside the top one during the prayer meeting. In his commentary about the revival, he said, there was no pride there. In that old building with its low rafters and bare floors, the core membership of the Azusa Street congregation never numbered more than 60 people. By mid-May of 1906, anywhere from 300 to 1,500 people began to try to attempt to fit into that building every single day. They stood in streets, People from diversity of backgrounds came together. They worshiped men and women, children, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, rich, poor, illiterate, and the educated. They worshiped. It was powerful. It was frequent. It was spontaneous. And their services went around the clock. And here's what their culture said about them. I quote from the Los Angeles Times. These meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street. They spend hours swaying back and forth in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer. They claim to speak in a heavenly language. 
There is a disgraceful intermingling of races. They cry, they run, they jump, they shout at the top of their voices. They claim to be filled with the Spirit. They have a one-eyed, illiterate preacher who stays on his knees most of the time with his head hidden between two wooden milk crates. He doesn't talk very much, but every once in a while he could be heard shouting, repent, repent, repent. He's supposed to be running the thing. They repeatedly sing the same song over and over. The comforter has come. The comforter has come. The comforter has come. A divine revolution. Can you see the ingredients? Can you see? They were stewards. They were servants. And they sacrificed. And it sparked a divine revolution. Historians would say something the Los Angeles Times would have no clue would happen. 100 years after that revival, that little 60-member church gave birth to what the 20th century would say is the most significant revival concerning world evangelism to occur. Over a billion souls can be connected to that 60-member congregation. And our generation in the 21st century has to have a divine revolution. Acts 2 hasn't changed. The priesthood principle hasn't changed. The kingdom hasn't changed. The king definitely hasn't changed. And his rule has not changed either. Our job is to serve, to sacrifice, and to steward the kingdom until he comes. And so I wanted to take just a minute and say if Muhammad Wazizi could douse himself with paint thinner, light a match, set himself on fire, and the sacrifice of his life could topple dictators around the world, if John Wesley could light himself on fire as he preached the gospel and multiplied thousands would come to hear him, if that little Tunisian street vendor could give his life, if 60 people People on Azusa Street could give their life. What could happen if you and I would climb back on the altar as a living sacrifice and say, God, set me on fire? I'll tell you what would happen. The world would come and watch us burn. Five hundred and forty nine times the Bible talks about the fire of God. The children of Israel were led by a pillar of fire. That's how important fire is. It leads you. It guides you. It gives you something to follow. I can sense if I've lost the fire. I can sense if I've lost the zeal and the passion that does not come because I create it. It's given from another world. Jesus came to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There are two kinds of fire in the scripture. The fire of judgment. You read about it over and over. It talks about how hell is constantly enlarging herself. Flames get bigger and bigger every day. The second fire is the fire of awakening or revival or revolution. And the church is in a race with those two fires, the fire of judgment. Right now, every single click of the top, the tick of the clock, people are entering eternity. One after another after another. One day it will be us. We'll stand before the Son of God who will say one of two phrases to us. Number one, well done. Enter in my good and faithful servant. Or number two, Depart from me. I never knew you. That's what we're competing with today. And revival and revolution 
is up to us. Occupy until he comes. Steward it until he comes. Serve it. Give yourself entirely to it. A living sacrifice on fire for what God is on fire for. Burning for what he burns for. I want us to stand up on our feet. In just a moment, I'm going to open uh, the altars up. Again, you have to have an altar to give a sacrifice. Am I saying you have to come to this altar? No. Am I saying you have to come to one of the altars or come to the front at one of the locations? Not necessarily. But I'm not saying you shouldn't either. I'm saying responding to the word is very important. The Bible says when we hear the word only and we don't do anything about it, we deceive ourselves. Again, this is his kingdom. He is the king. He has rule. My job is to simply invite you to say, are you a living sacrifice today? So that would mean there's several people I want to talk to, but first, I want to talk to those of you who feel like you, the fire in your life has grown cold. You can look back over your life and you would say there have been seasons where I was more on fire than I am now. It's not that there's not ups and downs. I get that. But you can look back and you could say, I was so on fire then and I've lost that. I don't have that. Or it's grown cold. It's what the Bible says in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. The word wax is a cooking term. It's the image of a kettle on a stove, on a flame, and it's boiling, and you remove the kettle from the flame, and then it slowly waxes cold. And that's what happens to us. It's a slow thing. It's a progressive thing. And so if you're here and you say, I've kind of lost it, I I've lost that fire, in just a few moments, I'm going to open up the, the altar because I don't want you to think, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just not where I once was. I want you to guard the fire in your life and not allow it to, before you know it, the love of God has grown cold in your life. The Bible says in Zechariah that God will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem. In other words, a wall does what? It keeps good things in and bad things out. So when you're on fire for God, it just surrounds you. It just engulfs you. It protects you. It guides you. It leads you. So if you're here and you would say, I feel like the fire of God in my life has begun to wax cold in just a moment, I want to invite you to come. The second group of people I want to talk to are those who you say, I'm on fire for God. I love Jesus. I know I'm on fire for him. But you want God to use you to spark a revival, not just in your life, but in your home, your family, in our city, in the workplace, in your school, in our nation. I'm reminded in Sam, uh, uh, Judges chapter 15, Samson the Bible says he grabs two foxes and he ties their tails together and he lights the tails on fire and they run into the Philistines harvest and the fire from those two foxes light that harvest, that Philistines harvest on fire and burns the harvest down. I love the imagery of it. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he sent them out two by two. And maybe you're hearing you say, God, I want you to use me to spark a revival. A part of a revival is not just what God does for you, but when you go out into the world, it begins to burn up the world's agenda that's stealing a generation. Because if you haven't noticed, hell is passionate about its harvest. Its silos are full. If, if you could, if you and I could 
catch a glimpse of what hell's strategies are and agendas are and where it thinks it's got this generation, it would say, the silos are full. We got generation Z. We've got that nation. We, we've got those people. We, we've got that gen Hell has a mighty harvest it's reaping. But God can set us on fire and send us into hell's territory and burn that harvest up. In other words, cause what the enemy is trying to use to destroy a generation, God can send us in to reap a harvest for his glory. He can do it. He will do it. So you're here and you'd say, man, I feel like I just need a fresh touch. I need God to ignite me once again. I need him to breathe on the embers that once burned bright. I need, I need to sense that fervency again, that boiling again. I, I want God to set me back on that fire once again. Or you're here and you're saying, I'm on fire, but I want God to use me to be a part of this end time awakening and revolution. A divine revolution is needed in our nation. A divine revolution is needed, but it starts here. I love what Psalm says, it's revive me, revive us, then revive thine work. Isn't it amazing how many people talk about the church isn't doing this and the church isn't doing that. Well, you don't start with revive the work, you start with revive me, revive us. I don't know about that church over there or that church over here, but I got this one here and I'm here to serve and steward and sacrifice until he comes. And I don't want him to come back and we were poor stewards and poor servants and we offered a poor, weak, diseased sacrifice. No, we give a living sacrifice. We give our very best and we ask heaven to come and lick it up with fire in Jesus' name. If you're here and you say, I've waxed cold, you're here and you want God to use you to be a part of this divine revolution that I believe he's beginning, not because I'm preaching it, but because we see it throughout church history, I want you to get out of your seat all across this room at every location. Get out of your seat. Don't hesitate and come quickly to the altar and offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Offer yourself today. Quickly come, quickly come, quickly come. His kingdom, his kingdom, he's king. It's his rule, it's not my rule. His agenda, not my agenda. What he desires, not what I desire. Come on, let's sing it together. Let's lift our hands towards heaven. Let no flesh glory in his presence. The king is here. The king is here. What could be more important? Some of you would gasp if Joe Burrow walked in. And you stare dead and cold at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No, 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 no. You need a divine revolution. The King is here. 
King Jesus is here. Come, King Jesus. Let that be your prayer. Oh, we honor you today. Thank you for invited, inviting us into your kingdom. Are you entering the king's throne room right now? You say, how do I do it? With thanksgiving and praise. With gratitude that he's allowed you and I to be a part of his kingdom. We bless you, Jesus. Is anybody here, you're just not using your gifts and your talents to build his kingdom? He's coming back. I don't know what your excuse will be. This is just a word from my spirit to your spirit. Don't bury that gift. Don't bury that talent. Don't say it doesn't matter. Don't say it's insignificant. Don't listen to the world that says, oh, they're just using you or this or that or this is his kingdom. Occupy until he comes. Come on, let God do something new in your heart right now. Just surrender right now. Still your heart, still your mind. Get your mind for just a few moments. It's amazing what God will do in a moment. We bless you today. a holy moment. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Father, for reigniting someone's heart today for your glory. Give them a fresh fire, a fresh sense of zeal and burning for your word, for your presence, for your purposes. To be a priest unto you. Lord, allow us to offer our lives every day and everywhere we go as that living sacrifice to you. Not just in a spiritual way, but our bodies, everything about us, everywhere we go, everything that we do, we're doing it as unto you. In Jesus' name. And now, Father, use some, like you use those two foxes, to go into this world and allow the fire of revival to be sparked and to be spread through them so that through them the fires of judgment would never be experienced by many because the fire of revival found its way through this group of people in Jesus name come on just right now thank you for a mighty harvest of souls that who hell thinks it's stolen who hell thinks it's already God we thank you for this great generation that you're bringing back. We thank you for this beautiful move of God that's going to occur in our time and our day. That we'll not just read about how it happened in times past, but we'll see it. We'll touch it. We'll pass it on to another generation. In Jesus' name, we honor you and we glorify you every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and you say, Marcus, I'm not right with Jesus Christ. You do not know the Lord. Jesus is not the Lord of your life. You've lived your life for yourself at all of our locations. You've not been serving him. It's been about your life. You've been the owner. And today you'd say, I've made a mess of it. Today you'd look at your life and it's nothing but brokenness in rebellion and you need a revolution 
You need God to make all things to be brand new. You'd say, Marcus, would you pray for me? I need to get right with God today. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand as high as you can at all of our locations. One, two, three. Throw that hand up as high as you can. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Many, many hands are going up. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Let's keep our hands raised. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you died on a cross and that you shed your blood for my sin. Forgive me in Jesus' name. I give you my heart. And we all said a big amen. Let's give the Lord one more good hand clap real quick.